have a monarch of the human rights watch as a witness in the case. Military generals have acknowledged to human rights workers and journalists that virginity tests have occurred in Egyptian prisons. Sunita has already won a civil case on the issue, making virginity tests illegal. Now she's seeking accountability in a military criminal court from the doctor who gave her the check. After a two week recess, the case will continue in mid March. For NPR News, I'm Merrick Kennedy in Cairo. Readers who grew up on the JP Rowling's books are awaiting her next work. This be a novel aimed at adults. Larry Miller in London reports the Harry Potter author is giving a few hints about this next book. The Scottish author whose success with Harry Potter transformed her from a struggling single mother to a billionaire says the freedom to explore new territory is a gift that Harry's success brought her. The worldwide English rights were bought by publisher Little Brown, a move away from her relationship with Bloomsbury, which took a chance on the then struggling author at the start of her career. Rowling says now that she's moved on, it's logical to have a new publisher. Waterstone, one of British biggest chain of retail bookstores, says the potential audience for this book is staggering. For NPR News, I'm Larry Miller in London. Violent crime is down in Detroit's public schools. A new report says armed robberies are down 58%. Felony assaults are off 43%. Incidents of students carrying concealed weapons are also down sharply. The West beat the East in this year's NBA All-Star Game. The final score, 152-149. to Kevin Durant scored a game-high 36 points. He was named Most Valuable Player. The Lakers' Kobe Bryant finished with 27 points. He became the All-Star Game's all-time leading scorer. I'm Dave Mattingly at NPR News in Washington. Support for NPR Worldwide comes from the Economic Development Authority of Fairfax County, Virginia. Hope to create a people and creative companies at powerofideas.com. A filmmaker captured images of the city of Homs in Syria. The video shows wounded civilians demonstrating room-to-room combat and blood on the streets. That film was broadcast in Britain. Hundreds of thousands of people have watched it online. There's a lot of many videos and news reports that have been the impression of something about cities. And opposition activists say dozens were killed in fighting there over the past two days ago. Fighting continued even as the country held a referendum on Sunday on changing the Constitution.
policy about whether you arm the opposition, help them get arms. Is there anything the U.S. can do short of that? I mean, logistical support for the Free Syrian Army, satellite images to help them set up these humanitarian corridors? Well, they don't have tanks and they don't have artillery, so I know there's a lot of frustration and I share it. This is a deeply, deeply distressing uh, set of events, but you have one of the most highly militarized, best defended countries on Earth because, of course, they spent an enormous amount of money with their Iranian and Russian friends, uh, so equipping themselves. And even if you were to somehow smuggle in automatic weapons of some kind, you're not going to be very successful against tanks. And so the, the dilemma is uh, how do we try to help people defend themselves? How do we push the uh, Russians, Chinese, and others who are, uh, in effect, uh, defending and deflecting uh, for the Assad regime to realize that, you know, this is undermining not only Assad's legitimacy, but theirs as well. You, in fact, called the Russians uh, despicable on this trip. Well, not personally, but in terms of actions, I think, you know, continuing to arm a government that is turning its heavy uh, weapons against uh, their own citizens. I mean, there are a lot of words to describe that. That's the voice of Secretary Clinton speaking to NPR's Michelle Kellerman at a hotel in Morocco at the end of her swing through North Africa. And to hear a longer version of that interview, you can go to our website, npr.org. And let's go next to Afghanistan, where a car bomb exploded outside a U.S. airbase today. The Taliban claimed responsibility for the attack, which killed nine people. This latest wave of violence follows reports of American soldiers burning several copies of the Muslim holy book, the Quran. U.S. officials say the Qurans were burned because detainees were using them to spread radical messages, and President Obama apologized for what he called an accident, but the violent demonstrations in response have led to questions about whether this incident could even affect the pace of the American withdrawal from Afghanistan. We're going to talk about this with NPR's Quill Lawrence. He's on the line from Kabul. Hi, Quill. Hi, Steve. There have been so many developments. Let's just run through them here. We had the Quran burnings. The news got out. What happened after that? Just walk us through the last several days. It, it took about a day for the news to get out across Afghanistan, and then for the five days after that, there were riots across the country. You know, it's every major city. Clashes with police. Uh, dozens of demonstrators ended up dead. On Thursday, at one of these demonstrations, two American soldiers were shot by an Afghan soldier who then escaped into the crowd. There were more demonstrations on Friday, and then Saturday, there was another murder of two American officers inside the Afghan Interior Ministry, perhaps one of the safest places in Kabul, most heavily secure places in Kabul. Uh, their killer is also still at large. Which is maybe the most shocking of all these incidents, and who's responsible? Well, uh, Afghan authorities have uh, named uh, a police intelligence officer in the force for two years. They said he just got his license to carry a pistol inside the secure area. It's possible he had spent some time in Pakistan, but that's not unusual at all for Afghans. He is still at large. He's being sought in this case. The larger consequences are much bigger. And after this happened, the Americans and the French and the British pulled all of their advisors. This is hundreds of military advisors and technical experts to every ministry in the Afghan government. And they have now been pulled out because it's considered unsafe. So it sort of poses a question that if the U.S. here is, is transitioning to an advisory role, but can't even uh, go and advise Afghans inside the safest part of Kabul, outside of the Indian president's palace, then what can they do? The Afghan defense minister and interior minister have canceled their trip to Washington. The U.S. embassy here is on lockdown even more so than their usual limited contact with the Afghan population. Well, that then raises another question, Will Lawrence. Uh, is it possible that the U.S. military might not even hang on there for two more years, which is the current plan? There's a lot of chat about that um, and questions. Uh, there was already some uh, discussion that they would transition a little bit faster than had previously been expected, that by 2013 they would be doing just a mentoring and training role. But even now, the question is, will they be able to mentor and train? I think the Wall Street Journal reported today that 10 of the 58 coalition uh, deaths in action this year, 10 of them, they were killed by Afghan soldiers who turned their weapons on them and who were supposed to be training them. 
Let me ask about the leading Afghan. You mentioned that maybe the last safe place in Afghanistan, a relatively safe place in Afghanistan, might be the presidential palace. What is President Hamid Karzai saying about all this? He, he finally came on television uh, and appealed for calm uh, yesterday, assured the Afghan people that the soldiers who burned the Qurans would be brought to justice. He mentioned several things about peace talks with the Taliban. What he didn't say was anything about these murders inside the Afghan interior ministry until he was asked by a reporter and then he expressed his condolences and speculated that it might have been another Westerner who did these murders and this is when the Afghan police had already uh, named uh, an Afghan suspect. So that hasn't gone down very well with military, American military diplomats here who are wondering if it's safe for them to go out and meet their Afghan counterparts. And Pierre's Quill Lawrence is in Kabul. Quill, thanks very much. Thanks, Steve. Had made 
made his name creating habits around products and making them famous. He had these two simple rules. Make a product into a daily habit. Find some simple cue, something that's going to trigger the consumer. And second of all, you have to give them the reward. Just like the habit loop that we just spoke about, he kind of intuited it years before laboratories had proven that it exists. So his cue, which he figured out for Pepsi and a toothpaste, was what? The film you feel on your teeth. For years, people had felt a film on their teeth and had never worried about it. And you don't need toothpaste to get rid of it. But what he said was, I can use this. And he created these posters that said, get rid of that film. Pepsodent gives you a beautiful smile. And what happened was, for the first time, people started buying toothpaste. Hopkins actually started the toothbrushing habit in America with Pepsodent. Okay, but it wasn't just people worrying about the film on their teeth. That, as you write, would not have turned it into a daily routine that everyone did. That's exactly right. What every consumer said was, well, after I brush my teeth, my mouth kind of tingles. And if I forget to brush my teeth, I miss that tingling. I crave that tingling. This gets to how habits work. The reason why these cues and rewards are so important is because over time, people begin craving the reward whenever they see the cue. And that craving makes a habit occur automatically. You give an example of changing a habit that you call a keystone habit. And the example has to do with, with the company Alcoa. That's right. For some reason, there are certain habits that seem to matter more than others. We call these keystone habits. And if you can change a keystone habit, you unlock all these other patterns in a, someone's life or in an organization. And the best example of this is Alcoa, the, the largest aluminum company on Earth when Paul O'Neill took it over and Paul O'Neill later became Treasury Secretary. When he first got hired, everyone expected him to come in and say, I'm going to concentrate on profits and efficiency and making people work harder. But instead what he said was, my number one priority is transforming worker safety habits within this company so that we have zero injuries, which is a big deal in a company where all of your employees handle molten metal. How did the crescendo of other better habits fall out of changing one habit? One of the characteristics of a keystone habit is that it creates a culture. That's why it seems to have such a profound influence on other patterns in our lives. For a long time, all the managers and the employees had kind of been at odds. In fact, there had been this huge strike of 15,000 workers in Alcoa. And then Paul O'Neill comes in and says, here's something that both of us can agree on. We need to change our habits around worker safety and management and workers were able to sit down at the same table. And all of a sudden they realized to change those habits, to make safety automatic, you have to do certain things. Like for instance, you have to look at your production line. When does the manufacturing process get out of whack? Because an out of whack manufacturing process is dangerous to employees. It also creates subpar aluminum. So if we make it safer for employees, if we bring everything in line, we actually make better aluminum also. By focusing on this one keystone habit, worker safety, Paul O'Neill set off a series of changes through the corporation that made it one of the most profitable companies on earth and one of the most efficient companies ever. There's another example you can use. It's for a particular product, Febreze, which is a pretty successful product now, but when it was introduced back in the 90s, uh, it was a tough sell. Febreze today is one of the most successful products on earth. It, it earns over a billion dollars a year. But when it first was released, it was a complete flop. Because Febreze is this amazing spray that you can spray on any fabric and it can make the smells disappear. So if you have a dog on your couch and your couch smells terrible and you spray Febreze on it, the smell just is eradicated. But the problem is that Procter & Gamble's marketers who are selling Febreze discovered people who have bad smells in their lives don't smell them after a little while. The cue for this habit completely disappears in people's lives. So what they did is they completely reformulated Febreze. It used to be something that was scentless. They invented a perfume that was strong enough to withstand the Febreze formula and poured it in so that Febreze had its own smell. And then instead of selling it to people who have bad smells in their lives, they decided to sell it to regular people who just clean their homes as the final step of the reward in a cleaning 
community. And they decided to piggyback on an existing habit. The habit of cleaning and then the good feeling you have after you put the final touches on some, <laughs> some cleaning. Exactly. It's that, it's that feeling at the end. Oh, I just vacuumed the carpet. It looks so nice. And now I can give a little spray of Febreze and all of a sudden things smell delightful. It's like a signal to myself that I've done a great job. All Procter Gable had to do was look for the cubes and the rewards. And all of a sudden this product became a huge seller. Thank you very much for joining us. Sure, absolutely. Charles Duhigg is the author of The Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do, Life and Business. Support for NPR Business News comes from Charles Schwab, offering globally diversified portfolio management with Windhaven Portfolios. More at schwab.com slash Windhaven. homeowner pulled out a ceramic coffee mug and smacked him over the head. Police are now looking for a suspect with a gash on his forehead and let's hope that the homeowner also managed to have a second cup of coffee. It's Morning Edition. From NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. At least nine people are dead, six others wounded after a suicide car bomb went off at the gates of the Jalalabad airport in eastern Afghanistan. Taliban claimed responsibility for the attack, saying it was revenge for the burning of a Muslim holy book on a U.S. military base. The explosion comes after nearly a week of deadly protests in Afghanistan over those burnings. More than 30 people have been killed in the violence, including four U.S. soldiers. The silent film The Artist won five Academy Awards at the Oscars in Hollywood last night, including Best Picture. It became the first silent film to win an award since the original Oscar ceremony 83 years ago. Its star, Jean Dujardin, won Best Actor. Meryl Streep took home a statue for Best Actress in Iron Lady. My friends, thank you, all of you, departed and, and here for this, you know, inexplicably wonderful career. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Octavia Spencer won Best Supporting Actress for The Help. Christopher Plummer took home an award for Best Supporting Actor for Beginners. Now at 82, he's the oldest person ever to win an Oscar. Republican presidential candidates continue their march through Michigan as Tuesday's pr presidential primary approaches. Michigan Public Radio's Rick Puda reports. Bobby Shostak is the Michigan Republican chairman. He says people are now looking to the GOP hopefuls to wrap up their Michigan campaigns by shifting the argument from which one is the most conservative to what they would do if elected president. Show me someone that's not.